The Veil of Moses Removed, Does the Bible Teach Premillennialism? by Rev. D. Earl Kripe. Read by Eric J. Miller. Read more at godspointofview.com. A copy of this book is available from Amazon in Kindle and paperback format. Link in the description. Chapter 3. The Dangers of Believing in Anti-Replacement Theology When the Pharisees wanted to compete against Jesus' doctrine, they resorted to non-biblical traditions and sought to rally the people on the basis of what their religious leaders believed and what had always been dearly held in the nation. Of course, we know that the Pharisees were teaching the doctrines of men that turned from the scriptures and from the truth. Jesus warned the people about mindlessly following that which was popular, traditional, and most generally subscribed to. This tactic of ancient religious humanism has been revived and used with much success by the defenders of Christian Zionism, which is premillennialism or dispensationalism. Replacement theology has been made into a pejorative term through a massive PR operation on the part of religious humanism and materialistic theology. It is implied that everyone should know that in the final analysis, God never intended to allow anything bad to happen to Abraham's natural children, and that there was no way God would even consider replacing the nation of Israel with anyone. The problem with this doctrine, as with most of the precepts of Christian Zionism, is that it is simply not true. So far from having any basis in the scriptures, that contrived doctrine conflicts with the Bible at every point where the issue is joined. From the beginning, God warned Adam and his children that he would cancel the covenant that he had made with Adam and Eve in the garden and that they would die if they failed to keep their part of the bargain. After the fall, God rejected the fig leaves, which were a symbol of natural man's efforts to cover his own sinfulness and prophetically foretold of a major change where the unrighteousness of man would be resolved by the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ. In Abel's sacrifice, there is another testimony that God was going to eliminate Adam's natural family and replace them with children that were born again through faith in Christ. When God called Abraham out of Haran into Mesopotamia, he made it an unconditional promise for a spiritual seed and confirmed that covenant of promise right on the banks of the Euphrates in Jesus Christ. See Galatians 3, 14-16. The particulars of that covenant of promise, at least such as could be known at that early date, are spelled out in the 12th and 17th chapters of Genesis. In Genesis 15, God made to Abraham a conditional promise for a natural seed and an earthly kingdom. That natural prospect was not realized at the time, but 430 years later when the covenant of law was made with Abraham's natural seed at Mount Sinai in Arabia. The 28th chapter of Deuteronomy spells out in childlike language the fact that this was a conditional covenant from the start. It did not offer man any eternal prospect unconditionally as did the covenant of promise made 430 years earlier. It warned the children of Israel that if they did not keep their part of the bargain, God would cut them off without remedy. Throughout the Old Testament, there are metaphors and allegories foretelling of a superior covenant of promise and a spiritual family that took precedence over the natural. We won't go into these things in detail right now, but we find them in the children of Abraham and Sarah, the children of Isaac and Rebekah, the children of Jacob, the two sons of Judah, and so on. The superiority of the spiritual over the natural and the inevitable change was repeatedly prophesied when the mother of the child of promise was invariably barren and required the miraculous visitation of God in order to bring the promise along. To testify to the superiority of the covenant of promise over the covenant of the flesh, it was always the secondborn who inherited the blessing and the birthright. This was to show that the program God had in mind would not be done in the natural way, which would have called for the oldest to receive the blessing and the birthright. In the Psalms, there are many messianic prophecies establishing the replacement of the nation of Israel with another people. One such place is in the 87th Psalm, where it said, His foundation is in the holy mountains. The Lord loveth the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. Glorious things are spoken of thee, O city of God, Selah. I will make mention of Rahab and Babylon to them that know me. Behold Philistia, and Tyre, with Ethiopia, this man was born there. And of Zion it shall be said, This and that man was born in her, and the highest himself shall establish her. The Lord shall count, when he writeth up the people, that this man was born there, Selah. 
as well the singers and the players on instruments shall be there. All my springs are in thee. In this New Testament prophecy, the gates of Zion are Christ and the church, and the dwellings of Jacob are the Old Testament and the natural seed. The gates of Zion take precedence over the dwellings of Jacob. The Lord loves the gates of Zion. The city of God is the heavenly Jerusalem which is above, which is the mother of us all. Those who will be the inhabitants of this heavenly city and live in this holy mountain of Zion are born again through faith in Christ. This and that man was born in her. Not a single person or town listed here is an Israelite or in Israel. The waters of life spring from the heavenly Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God, which will replace the earthly dwellings of Jacob. In the prophecies, God repeatedly warned the nation of Israel that he would replace them with other people. These would be people who had not been called the people of God before. He would divorce them and he would no longer be their God. He would rip them up and cast them out and leave them neither root, stock, nor stem. When Jesus came to earth, he warned the Israelites what would happen if they rejected him and the kingdom that he was offering them. In one place, he told them that there would be a great weeping when they saw people coming in from all over the world and sitting down in the kingdom of God with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Moses while they themselves were cast out. Eventually, when he could not reform the nation and they had made it clear that they were rejecting him, he sat on the hill outside of Jerusalem and wept over it. How many wonderful things would have been theirs if only they had known what he was offering them and if they had accepted it. He would have done it, but they did not want it. The next day, Jesus went into the city of Jerusalem, cast out the priests and the money changers from the temple, took all authority and office away from the scribes and the Pharisees, and made their house desolate as Daniel the prophet had said he would. At that time, he told them that the kingdom was taken away from them and given to other people. Now, my friends, if you can understand the English language, you can understand this. From the beginning of time, the failure of the people of the flesh was fully prophesied. God warned repeatedly what he was going to do, and when Jesus came, he did it. He did it not only because of their derelictions, as we learned in Jeremiah 31, 31, but he did it because it had to be that way. In order for there to be an eternal family living together with God forever, there had to be new birth by a new parent into a new kingdom. The program of redemption in this world and the plan of God from the Garden of Eden called for the nation of Israel to serve a certain interim and parenthetical operation in bringing it to pass. Their position in the program of God in time and history is identified in the third chapter of Galatians. The natural seed, the geographical land, the old covenant of law, was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Anyone who does not believe in the biblical doctrine of replacement theology, a doctrine that pervades the scriptures from Alpha to Omega, does not understand the gospel. He has no valid concept of the kingdom of God, does not know what sanctification is and how it is achieved, and ultimately is doomed to spend his theological life railing against Christ and the church and promoting the natural people. The problems with that position are many, but the simplest and most revolting is that these darlings of the Christian Zionist are the people that Jesus called liars, murderers, hypocrites, and children of the devil. He acknowledged that they were Abraham's natural seed, but denied that they were Abraham's spiritual seed, or that they had any inheritance in the covenant of promise. Jesus told these people that they could not possibly escape the damnation of hell. The church, which the Christian Zionists wants to put in a secondary position to the nation of Israel in time and history, is Christ's lovely bride. The church is the bride that he purchased with his own blood. The church is the pillar and ground of truth, the bride who is bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. The bride that he will perfect and present himself on that final day. The glorious bride not having any spot or wrinkle or any defect. This bride is the church that Jesus said he was going to build and nothing in heaven, earth, or hell could stop him from doing it. Jesus gave the apostles the keys to his church and named it the kingdom of God on earth in this last dispensation. This church is the entity to which Jesus gave the kingdom when he took it from the nation of Israel in his Passion Week. Slandering his bride will get you crossways with Christ. You can count on it. One of the ways of doing that is to claim that some immoral, unfaithful, filthy, ungrateful, unprincipled broad from the derelict days means more to Christ than his lovely bride. 
Yet, that is exactly what the Christian Zionist is saying about the church in juxtaposition to natural Israel. If you do not believe in replacement theology, you are in a dangerous position with God, not only now, but in that day. That danger and dire consequences are compounded by the fact that now you have read this chapter and you have less excuse than you had before. End of chapter 3 of The Veil of Moses Removed by Rev. D. Earl Kripe, read by Eric J. Miller.